Hi, welcome to my channel. I'm Erin Earth, and today is my second video about Ida Craddock. Today it's going to be on her research on the sacred symbol of the cross and the evolution of the Ankh. In my first video about Ida, I talked about how I believe that I actually was Ida Craddock in my past life, and um, I explain the evidence in my first video regarding that. And I'd like to get in today to Ida's book called Lunar and Sex Worship. It's available online. It is only available in hardback, and it is an investment. It's not a cheap book. I'm going to start on page 111, where Ida starts to really get in to the deep research that she did on the history of the cross. On page 111, she says, But what decided the choice of the cross as a symbol of sexual union? It was the result of a very natural evolution from grosser symbols. Whatever was upright, rigid, and either conical or clubbed at the end, seems to have suggested to the crude and simple brains of primitive men the male organ of generation. Thus, the torch, Thyrosus, triangle, knobbed stick, tall tree, upright pole, arrow, spear, sword, the last three as piercers, upright stone, church spire, tower, minaret, club, stump, pine cone, these and a thousand similar objects became natural symbols of the organ whose manifestation of the mysterious generative principle within themselves was, for them, a never-ceasing wonder. And it was to give expression to this phallic symbolism, Greek phallos, meaning the male organ, that religious bodies originally erected a tower a minaret or a steeple over their houses of worship as an emblem of the generator father. While the upright object became the symbol of the phallus or linga, linga is the Hindi name for phallus, that which was oval naturally became the symbol of the female principle. And so we find this oval figure reverenced as the door of life through which every human being must pass at birth. So much is it venerated that it is delineated, either in its natural outline or in more conventionalized forms, not alone on the adornments of heathen idols, but on many of the stained glass windows of modern Christian houses of worship, on church bookmarkers, and even as a frame around the Blessed Virgin and Holy Child. In Christian countries, its meaning has been well nigh forgotten, but in India today, there are perhaps few, if any of the natives who do not understand what the sacred oval, the yoni, or argha means. From its first bald representation, the yoni evolved in two directions. In one direction, it tended to become symbolized by saucers, bowls, cups, chairs, baskets, or similar receptacles, by skiffs, arcs, or other boats in which the souls of the unborn might cross the waters of the underworld or of night into a new life, by a doorway, window, archway, or other entrance, and even by a narrow aperture, such as a cleft in a rock, by cup-like blossoms or by fruits whose shape, like the fig, might suggest the virgin womb, or whose abundance of seeds, as in the pomegranate, might symbolize the pregnant genitrix. And finally, by such conventional symbols as the crescent or full moon, in this last, it of course was emphasized by the connection between the lunar and menstrual periods. To this apparently gross symbolism, we owe the evolution of the beautiful legend of the Holy Grail, the sacred cup from which Jesus drank at the Last Supper, which always appeared borne by angels and veiled in red sunlight. 
the sacred color of the menses, and which only a pure-minded knight could hope to touch. In this, the legend of the Holy Grail correlates with that of the Cup of Huon of Bordeaux, which yielded the most precious wine, but in the hands of a good man only. In the other direction, the yoni tended to become more and more conventionalized. From an oval into a circle, then into a diamond-shaped lozenge. And finally, the oval elongated and narrowed into a mere horizontal line, which was crossed with another simple upright line for the phallus, and thus was the cross evolved, signifying the union of the two sexes in marriage. Later on, the cross sometimes shifted on its axis to form an X, and seems to have been at times used to mark the equinoxes, those points where the ecliptic intersects the equinoctical. This emblem of the cross, the crossing of a horizontal with an upright line, was a happy idea and must have commended itself to the majority, alike for its euphemism, euphemism and its simplicity. <clears throat> but the cross did not always consist of two simple lines merely. Sometimes the upper half of the vertical line was bent into the sacred oval or ankh, making what was called the ankh cross or crux on sata or handled cross, since many of the figures on the Egyptian monuments carried this cross in their hands, using the oval as a handle. The loop, of course, is the female principle, and the three straight arms are said to stand for the phallic triad, the phallus and the scrota which flank it. I am inclined to think, however, that the Ankh cross at first symbolized the tip of the phallus by its loop, as this seems but a natural form for the upright line of the cross to be expanded into and that it was at first solid, and that it was not until the representation of this unk cross oval was made in a mere outline and upon a flat surface where it was impossible to know that this swollen line was intended to be solid, that it got to be used as the symbol of the yoni and as a handle to carry the cross by. If this theory be correct, it would afford a very simple explanation of the T or Tao cross why it became so popular a symbol of virility and the phallic triad, as it would be a mere matter of subtraction of this T from the feminine oval of the Ankh cross. It is perhaps for this reason that in an old papal book, Missal Romanum, illustrated by a monk, Venice, 1509, we see a picture of a confessor of the Roman Catholic Church wearing the Egyptian crux ansanta instead of the pallium. In this picture, it will be noticed that the fringe of the hair of the tonsure with the short beard form a ring, possibly a yoni ring, around the face of the confessor. It is indeed a generally received idea among mythologists that the, tonsure, that the tonsured crown of both Christian and heathen monks represents sometimes the fringed yoni and sometimes the disk of the sun surrounded by its rays. It will be remembered how the solar heroes in certain tales are shorn of their hair as winter sets in and the sunlight wanes. In sex worship, hair is a symbol either of virility or of the feminine yoni, and in sun worship, a symbol of the sun's rays and its fructifying energy. Standing thus with his head thrust through the oval of the crooks, ansanta, ansanta, ansata, A-N-S-A-T-A, -A. the minister of God presented to devotees a living, though conventionalized emblem of that union of the male and female principles of creative energy, which is more frankly symbolized by the lingam 
and of which the Hermes post is also a conventionalized expression. I give here two palliums, one that worn by Roman Catholic priests today, the other the crux an sata, worn by papal ecclesiastics three or four centuries ago. Both are taken from Inman's ancient pagan and modern Christian symbolism. As in the case of the picture of the confessor given before, the head of the man of God thrust through the oval typifies the idea which has been variously represented by the cross, the lingam, the Hermes post, or terminus, the Assyrian god, sun god, standing on the crescent moon, and other equivalents of the linga in Yoni. Another of the many survivals of sex worship in Christian ritualism is shown in this symbol, which Inman gives as delineated in Greek churches and as apparently of pre-Christian origin. I'll keep going. But one swallow does not make a summer. And the argument which would prove the Christians to have belonged to the Osirian religion of Egypt because of their adoption of the Crux Ansata would also prove the Christians to have belonged to the Shiva or Vishnu religions of India, since many Christian churches proudly support upon their roofs certain curious floral cup pinnacles which are recognized all through India even by the least educated, as the linga in yoni of one or the other of these worships. In the early Christian, if the early Christians belonged to one of these three religions, it is not likely that they belonged to the others. The more correct view to take of the matter probably is that Christianity, as has been the case with every other religion that ever existed, fell heir to all the myths and symbolism that went before. Doubtless, it is for this reason that we find the apostle laying such stress on the fact that when he preaches Christ, he preaches him crucified. The Messiah presented on the cross would harmonize more readily with the popular pagan myths and so win a hearing from the populace. In fact, Faustus, a Manchian bishop addressing St. Augustine says, You have but substituted your agape, or love feasts, for the sacrifices of the pagans, for their idols, your martyrs, whom you serve with the same honors. You appease the shades of the dead with wines and feasts. You celebrate the solemnities of the Gentiles, their calends and their solstices. And as to their manners, those you have retained without any alteration, and nothing distinguishes you from the pagans except that you hold your assemblies apart from them. And in some cases, probably Forlong is right when he remarks, the Christian priest used as his own what he could not remove, or he was perhaps himself too ignorant or bigoted toward the old faiths, to wish to see them entirely effaced. In other cases, the Christian priests could not consistently protest against an emblem held sacred by the heathen when he himself held the same emblem in reverence. Both Protestant and Catholic missionaries who first entered the territory about Hudson's Bay found the adoration of the tree of the cross was quite common in those regions of North America as a magic talisman and an emblem of fertility. The cross, as I have shown, was originally a euphemism for the idea which the lingam of India more crudely, though just as reverently, represents. It is a popular belief among housemaids and other illiterate young women in Christian lands that if they place their shoes on Friday night by their bedside in the form of a T, like the Tao cross, their future husband will appear to them. Friday, be it remembered, is the day of Venus, and the Tao cross is the phallic symbol of the male triad, i.e. 
the phallus, and the testicle. In India, the girls anxious to marry appeal to the linga, as the housemaids in Christian lands do to its equivalent, the Tao cross. And I'll show you a picture here of the linga um, and the linga in yoni, the traditional Hindu lingam. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. I'm stopping on page 117. I really appreciate you listening. If you have any questions or thoughts or anything you want to share about this fascinating history of our sacred symbolism, especially as it relates to, in, the, in terms of this topic, sex worship, um, please just leave them in the comments. Have a great day.